Are you guys ready to move on to urinary tract infections? Should we do another giveaway of our wonderful resource manual? Okay, the first one or two to the mic. All right, I have to think of something. Okay. This is a yes or no and a brief explanation. April 1st, Mr. Smith has a positive urine specimen that's positive for MRSA. And we report that to NHSN because it's the first MRSA specimen for the month. Then on April 7th, he has a positive MRSA blood culture. Do we report that and why? Oh, you have to go to the mic. Run. So yes, we report it because it's a blood specimen. Very good. It, it represents a unique blood source. Okay, one more. So this is going to tell us who was paying attention very early in the day when I told you today is a very special day because it's blank, and on today you can get blank from blank. <laughs> Go to the mic. <laughs> First day of spring, free ice cream cone from Dairy Queen. All right, there you go. Dairy Queen is going to love me. <laughs> Okay, so you ladies see me after the session, and I will have your manuals for you. Okay, okay we're going to move on to healthcare-associated infection module for urinary tract infection reporting. Our learning objectives for this session are to describe the rationale for monitoring urinary tract infections in the NHSM, Describe the methodology, protocols, and definitions used in monitoring UTI events, and correctly apply the UTI definitions and protocols through some case studies. Why monitor urinary tract infections in long-term care facilities? Well, as Janita pointed out earlier, UTIs are the most frequently reported infections in nursing homes, and we all know that they are driving up our antibiotic use among residents and causing what? C. difficile. We know that focused monitoring of symptomatic urinary tract infections, both catheter and non-catheter associated, helps us to identify trends in these infections and then provide data to improve quality in our long-term care facilities. And then, of course, tracking these, in, these events will also inform our infection prevention and control staff on the impact of the targeted prevention efforts. And this is really important in long-term care facilities is feeding back that data and what it means to your first-line staff. By reporting UTI events into the NHSM, facilities have access to calculated rates of UTIs among all residents in the facility, and this includes catheter-associated and non-catheter-associated urinary tract infections. Facilities are also able to identify which residents are more prone or more susceptible to getting UTIs, and this includes organisms that are most prevalent in the facility associated with urinary tract infections. Facilities are also able to monitor antibiotic use for UTIs in their facility and, again, assess the impact of prevention efforts over time in the facility. So all of the data that you put into NHSN, you're able to get back out so that you can use for the purpose of educating and training your staff so that you can drive down infections. The NHSN UTI protocol was adapted from the 2012 revised McGeer criteria. Have the website on here if you're interested in reading the paper, but my guess is that most of you have already read the paper and probably know it better than I do. Here is the website to the urinary tract infection information. Again, if you look on the left navigation bar of our homepage, you can see that there's a section specifically for surveillance for urinary tract infections. You can click this, or you can also click in directly in the box, and that takes you to our trainings, our protocols, our forms, table of instructions, supporting materials, etc. I think most of us would agree with this, that UTI prevention begins with surveillance. We must know the problem before we can put solutions in place to resolve that problem, and we, we get this information through data. 
When using the NHSN definitions, consistency is very important as it ensures comparability of the UTI data. It ensures that we are comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges across all long-term care facilities with like settings and like populations. There are some important conditions that should be met when applying the NHSN UTI surveillance definitions. First is, are the symptoms new or acutely worse? This is an important consideration because the definitions do not incorporate a time period for when reporting a second UTI. So this is a little bit different um, from what, if you work in the long in the acute care setting, this is a little bit different than what you are seeing on the acute care side. Does the resident have an indwelling urinary device in place? This is important because our UTI criteria do differ based on the presence of an indwelling urinary catheter. And then, is there evidence of infection? So the presence of localizing urinary tract infections is significant. The colony counts for um, the urine cultures is significant, as this is required to meet, a urine culture is required to meet the NHSN UTI criteria. So you must have symptoms that are new or acutely worse, as well as that positive urine culture. You will have disagreements between the clinical picture and the surveillance definitions, no doubt. We hear about this all the time, and I'm sure your acute care partners can give you a lot of stories where this happens. Surveillance definitions, the reason is, is that your surveillance definitions are used to look at populations, infections in populations, versus your clinical picture is looking at resident level infection data, right? The clinical picture, you have access to everything you need access to to identify the, the best treatment plan, diagnosis and treatment plan for that resident versus with your surveillance definitions, you don't always have all of that information available. It is important that if you do have a clinical disagreement that for NHSN reporting that you do follow the NHSN protocol exactly. Again, we're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, so we need to make sure that the users are reporting objective data, or as objective as we can get data, and that is comparable between facilities. If you have a specific case that you're not really sure about, or maybe your medical staff disagree, please feel free to share that case to the NHSN mailbox and let us give you some feedback, and we're happy to do that. And our feedback will be based on, does this meet the NHSN criteria for UTI or does it not? And we'll give you our reasons why. And then we, we have a lot of users who will do that and we'll provide you the feedback for you to take back to your administrators if need be. And these questions can be submitted to NHSN at cdc.gov. NHSN UTI criteria are available for certified skilled nursing facilities and nursing homes, intermediate chronic care facilities for the developmentally disabled. Only UTI events representing or presenting greater than two calendar days after admission to your facility are considered to be healthcare associated events that would be reported and to the NHSN. <clears throat> If a resident, so this means if a resident is transferred from an acute care facility and develops signs and symptoms of a UTI within the first two calendar days of admission to your long-term care facility, it would not be considered an HAI and instead would be considered present on admission for your facility and not reported to NHSN for your facility. Now, of course, best practice, as we all know, would be to contact the transferring facility and let them know that the resident did have a UTI on admission to your facility because a court, their protocols, if they're following NHSN, are to report that as a UTI for their facility. Here's these requirements again. Again, the NHSN monthly reporting plan must be completed for the calendar month in which the facility will enter UTI data. Facilities must report the numerator, which are those catheter and non-catheter associated UTI events, and denominator data for the entire facility. It's referred to as fac wide n So for all of the modules within NHSN, fac wide n is the location. There is no location-specific surveillance option within the long-term care facility component. 
And then we recommend that facilities perform UTI surveillance for at least six consecutive months to provide meaningful measures. And this really holds true across, across all of the modules that I've talked about today. It's not a requirement, but we do highly recommend it because if facilities are only reporting a month here and a month there, it's really hard to get that trend data for your facility. Here is an example of what your monthly reporting plan will look like. So again, we add, we go to reporting plan, we add, and then the focus for UTI will be the HAI module. So right now, we UTIs are the only um, event option under the HAI module, and we hope to continuously grow that as we have more long-term care facilities come on board reporting NHSN and as our team continues to grow. Here is an example of the customizable UTI event form that we've talked about. This form is unique. It is not the same form that, that reports lab ID events. Um, one form per UTI event, and the forms can be found on our website, and these forms do have accompanying uh, table of instructions as well. Let's look at some key terms and definitions that you should be familiar with if you are following urinary tract infections in the NHSN. The first one being date of event. You will notice this is going to be a little different than what we talked about for lab ID event reporting. The date of event for UTI is the date when the first clinical evidence, so signs and or symptoms, of the UTI appeared or the date the urine culture specimen to meet that infection criteria was collected, whichever comes first. Indwelling urinary catheter is defined by NHSN as a drainage tube that is inserted into the urinary bladder through the urethra, is left in place, and is connected to a drainage bag or collection system. This does include leg bags. This is commonly referred to as a Foley catheter. For NHSN reporting, the following are not considered as indwelling urinary catheters. The straight catheters, the in and out catheters, do not count. A suprapubic catheter is not considered as an indwelling urinary device for NHSM. Condom catheters are not considered, nor are nephrostomy tubes. And I point this out because is I, I believe that the MDS includes all of these devices in their UTIs, and NHSN does not for catheter-associated. Now, that does not mean that you don't report a UTI if the resident has a suprapubic catheter. What that means is that you would follow the criteria for the non-catheter-associated UTI, which we're going to get to. Okay. There are two specific types of UTIs in the NHSN module. There's the symptomatic UTI, referred to as SUTI, and then there's the asymptomatic bacteremic UTI, referred to as a booty. Within each of these specific types of UTIs, they include both catheter-associated and non-catheter-associated UTI events, which means that if you're following the module, your facility must report all UTIs irrespective of, of an indwelling catheter being in place. A symptomatic UTI, or SUTI, is defined as a resident demonstrates signs and symptoms that localize that infection to the urinary tract. These events can occur, again, in residents with or without an indwelling urinary device. The asymptomatic bacteremic UTI, or a booty, these events occur when the resident has no signs or symptoms localizing to the urinary tract, but does have a matching urine and blood have matching urine and blood cultures positive for at least one organism, and this is regardless of whether a catheter is in place. Okay, next we're going to talk about the catheter-associated symptomatic urinary tract infection criteria. When conducting surveillance for CASUTI, we call it catheter-associated UTI, there are some questions that you would want to ask yourself. First, does that resident have an indwelling urinary device that was in place for more than two days and present on the day of event or the day before the event? If so, 
Does the resident have one or more qualifying, and I mean NHSN qualifying, Kasuti signs or symptoms? And does that resident have a urine culture that meets the NHSN criteria? If so, then you are likely looking at a catheter-associated symptomatic urinary tract infection, or Kasuti. I want to look closely at the colony count uh, of bacteria requirements for a Kasuti. If a urinary catheter is in place at the time of specimen collection, then a positive urine culture will be defined as positive urine culture with equal to or greater than 10 to the fifth colony forming units per milliliter of any number of microorganisms, at least one of which must be a bacteria of equal or greater than 10 to the fifth or 100,000. On your handouts, there is a typo. Please correct the symbol. I think the symbol I have just greater than 10 to the 5, it should be greater or equal to 10 to the 5. And it would just be if you printed the handouts from the website. If a urinary catheter is not in place at the time the specimen is collected, but was removed within two calendar days, the resident can still meet Kasuti criteria if there is a voided urine specimen with equal to or greater than 10 to the fifth or 100,000 colony forming units of no more than two species of microorganisms. And again, at least one of those organisms must be of bacteria. If a specimen is collected via straight catheter or in and out catheter, the specimen must include equal or greater than 10 to the two, so 1,000, colony forming units of any number of microorganisms, again, with at least one bacteria of equal or greater than 1,000 or 10 to the two colony forming units. This is important. This was a change last year um, in 2016, but at least one organism in that urine culture must be bacteria. Yeast and other microorganisms which are not bacteria are not acceptable UTI pathogens. So what that means is that if you have yeast in the urine, that's okay as long as you have one more qualifying bacteria. But if yeast is all the only thing growing in that urine, it does not meet the urine culture requirement for, for NHSM. I know this slide is a little bit busy, but I do want to review the constitutional um, criteria that are in NHSN. And these are very similar to what you will see in the McGeer definitions, if you are familiar, with the exception of the exclusion criteria based on uh, recognized infection cause. The first one being fever. Fever is defined as a single temperature of greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit or greater than 99 degrees Fahrenheit on more than one occasion, or an increase in greater than 2 degrees Fahrenheit over baseline. Rigors, shaking and chills. Resident could have new onset hypotension with no alternate non-infectious cause. New onset confusion or functional decline with no alternate diagnosis. In addition to leukocytosis greater than 14,000 cells or a left shift, another symptom is new or marked increase in suprapubic pain or costovertebral angle pain or tenderness, acute pain, swelling, or tenderness of the testes, epididymis, or prostate, or purulent discharge from around the catheter. So to meet a Kasuti criteria, the resident must have one or more of, the, of these listed signs and symptoms. Let's look at an example. Mrs. T is a resident in your facility. An indwelling urinary catheter was inserted on March 1st. On March 5th, the nurse practitioner documented that Mrs. T complained of suprapubic pain. The following day, on March 6th, a specimen collected from the Foley catheter was sent to the lab and subsequently tested positive for greater than 100,000 colony forming units of E. coli. Ms. T does meet NHSN criteria for Kasuti on March 5th since the indwelling urinary device was present on the day of the event and she had at least one qualifying documented symptom, which was her suprapubic pain. Okay? Now I want to review some of the constitutional signs and symptoms 
in more detail just to provide you with a little more clarity. And these, the information I'm going to give you in the next few slides are based on some of the common questions that I see come across our NHSN mailbox. So I'm hoping that this will increase some clarity for you. We recognize that there are differences in uh, temperature measurement and documentation across facilities. When I say documentation, I mean documentation or lack thereof. And for NHSN surveillance purposes, no specific route of measurement is required, nor is a conversion based on the route of collection required. Instead, the temperature value to meet the surveillance definition should be the temperature that's documented in the chart without any conversion, and it doesn't matter the route that it was collected. And we do this to simplify the surveillance definitions for you, and we've also been made aware that sometimes the route's not documented, or many times the route's not documented, so we do not expect for our facilities to have to dig through data to, to get that information. I also want to point out some of the uh, some of the variances that you may see between the NHSN criteria and the McGeer criteria. How many of you are familiar with the McGeer criteria when applying fever to the UTI criteria? Since fever is considered a nonspecific sign of infection, NHSN surveillance definitions require fever to be used regardless if there's the presence of another potential infection source. So that is a variance from the McGeer definitions, okay? In other words, a fever with a urine culture that indicates a kasuti, regardless of the fever could be caused by, let's say, a, res you know, a respiratory infection that the resident has, would still be used to meet the kasuti criteria. And again, this deviation, we had a lot of discussion about if we wanted to make this deviation from the McGear, and ultimately we decided to do that so that it increases the objectivity of the surveillance definitions, and, and also it will increase the surveillance burden on the, on the IPs or, or whomever is looking at these criteria in the nursing home. I know that our hospital partners, before this was put into place, the IPs had reported that they spent a lot of time, hours of time, searching the charts for another cause of infection so they would not have to report a UTI or, or another infection. And we don't want our nursing home IPs to have to go through the same torture. I get a lot of questions about how do you define baseline? And NHSN does not provide a definition for baseline, but my feedback and guidance to users is when considering the baseline for a resident, you want to keep in mind the average temperature that that resident has on their good days when they're not sick, and you want to take a baseline from that or take an average from that, a, doc, a previously documented when the resident has nothing else going on, they're feeling good and healthy, that's where you want to get your baseline because that's going to give you the most accurate um, picture of if something changes because what you're really looking for is something change that could indicate that an infection is going on or something's going on with my resident. Hypotension. The surveillance definition, NHSN surveillance definition for hypotension does not assign a value to define hypotension. For this reason, facilities should use the vital sign parameters as stated in your policies and procedures. What that means is if it's documented that 100 over 50 is considered hypotension for Ms. Smith, then it is considered hypotension for Ms. Smith because NHSN does not define what that value is. So you will need to depend on your policies and your facility to define a hypotensive case. Again, similar to the fever uh, that I talked about earlier, hypotension is also considered a nonspecific sign that can be used to meet uh, criteria even in the presence of another possible infection source. However, hypotension can be excluded or should be excluded if there's a documented non-infection source, such as a new medication known to cause hypotension or the resident has a cardiac event. That would be the only exception um, in, in attributing the hypotension to another source is if it's non-infectious. New onset of confusion. We recognize that McGeer and MDS have very specific parameters to define new onset of confusion. 
We have kept it very simple for NHSN reporting. For NHSN, you're looking, has the resident had an acute change in his or her mental status? Something new is happening, something that wasn't there yesterday or last week. That is what you're looking for. We are not asking you to meet the same parameters or criteria that are outlined in McGear. But remember that with the new onset confusion, it's only applicable in the presence of leukocytosis as well. So for NHSM, you have to have a new onset of confusion in addition to leukocytosis. Which brings me to leukocytosis. Leukocytosis is defined as an elevation in the number of white blood cell counts in the blood. This will be found usually in the complete blood count and differential blood test in the patient's medical record. You may see the physician or nurse practitioner document neutrophilia or left shift. So neutrophilia is indicates that there's an inflammation or infection, and left shift is, um, I don't know that you would see left shift. Are you guys seeing this kind of documentation in the medical records? Are you seeing... Neutrophilia or left, so you are seeing these. Okay. So I'm glad I put it on here then. This is an example of what you may see in the lab report. So you can see here neutrophilia defining your white blood cell count. So this red, it indicates that this is a positive. It's over 14,000 leukocytes. And then when you're looking at your immature cells, you're looking at the 10, and this is greater than the 6% bands. And I don't know if, if users will get down to this level, but I just wanted you to be aware in case you do see this or you're required to look at a lab report to determine if UTI is met. And again, if you have any questions, I'm giving you guys some time to write this down because I know this slide is not in your handout. Um, if you have any questions about any of this, you can absolutely send it to the NHSN at cdc.gov mailbox and we can help you. Uh, just be sure if you do send something like a blood test that there is absolutely no resident identifier information on that, okay? So you would maybe just want to copy and paste this middle section and send that without any resident identifiers and ask what does this mean and we can help you. Okay, let's look at an example here. Mr. Unforgettable, a resident from a local long-term care facility has a urinary catheter in place for three days for acute urinary retention. On day three, he spikes a fever of 100.9 degrees Fahrenheit and has a cough with shortness of breath. The physician orders a urine culture and it comes back positive with greater than 10 to the 5 colony forming units of Pseudomonas aeruginosus and Candida albicans. Upon further workup, Mr. Unforgettable is determined not to have any other symptoms that meet the NHSN Kasudi criteria, but a chest X-ray does show infiltrates in the right upper lobe of the lung. Does Mr. Unforgettable have a reportable Kasudi? A is yes, or B is no. And you can use your clickers for this. Okay. Very good. Impressive work. Yes, he does have a reportable Kasudi because fever is considered a nonspecific sign of infection and the urine culture is positive for at least one bacteria. And here's what it looks like on the um, figure in the NHSM protocol. So you can see here he had one or more of the following. He had the qualifying fever, and then he had the specimen source with any number of microorganisms. Okay. So we've talked about Kasudi, catheter-associated urinary tract infection. Um, so next we're going to talk about non-catheter-associated symptomatic urinary tract infection. If you guys need to take a drink of water or 
something? When conducting non -catheter surveillance for non-catheter-associated symptomatic um, urinary tract infection, I'm going to refer to this just as SUDI, okay? You're going to ask yourself some similar questions that we asked earlier. Does the resident have an indwelling catheter in place, or was it removed within two calendar days prior to the event? So answer if the answer is no then you're going to look at the SUDI for the non-catheter-associated criteria and determine if the resident has one or more localized signs or symptoms. And if the resident does, then you're going to look at the urine culture requirements to determine if the resident meets the urine culture requirements. If all of those are met, then you're likely looking at a non-catheter-associated symptomatic urinary tract infection, SUDI. Since there are three sets of criteria for SUDI, I thought it would be easier, instead of breaking these out into individual slides, if I just used this figure. This figure is available in the UTI protocol and also in the resource manual. I recommend that you print this, have this available when you're conducting surveillance and entering data into NHSN because it will make your life so much easier. The resident can meet criteria one with acute dysuria. So burning upon urination, or and or acute pain, swelling, or tenderness of the testes, epididymis, or prostate. If the, if the resident does not meet criteria one, you always have criteria two. So in criteria two, the resident can have either of the following, either fever and or leukocytosis, so just one of those, and one or more of the following, costovertebral angle pain or tenderness, new or marked increase in suprapubic tenderness, gross hematuria, new or marked increase in incontinence, new or marked increase in urgency, or new or marked increase in frequency. If the resident does not have a fever or leukocytosis, but the resident does have two or more of those same signs or symptoms, the resident can meet criterion three. In addition to meeting one of these criteria, the resident must also have that qualifying uh, urine culture, as we've already talked about. Let's look at an example. Mrs. T, a resident in your nursing home, on March 1st, she developed an increase in incontinence and new suprapubic pain. Later that day, a Foley catheter was inserted. The following day, on March 2nd, a specimen collected from the Foley catheter was sent to the lab and subsequently tested positive for greater than 100,000 colony-forming units of E. coli. Mrs. T does meet criteria for a SUDI, but it is not considered a CUSUDI because the Foley catheter had not been in place for greater than two calendar days on the date of event, which was March 1st. Okay, now let's test your knowledge. The clickers will work, hopefully, for this question. On day one, Mrs. Unforgettable, a long-term care resident, complains of burning when she urinates and states that her urine looks and smells funny. She has not had an indwelling urinary device in the past month. However, a straight catheter was used three days ago for urinary retention. On day two, a clean catch, voided urine specimen was collected. On day three, no symptoms are documented. Day four, the urine culture is positive for mixed flora, E. coli, and candida glabrata, 10 to the fifth colony forming units. Is this a reportable SUDI? Yes, because she has acute dysuria and the urine culture is positive for at least one bacteria. Or B, no, because the urine culture grew more than two species of microorganisms. Okay. Impressive work. This one was tough. So the answer is no, because the urine culture grew more than two species of microorganisms. So let's look at it here. So remember, 
the, she had a clean catch voided urine, which means that she needed a positive culture with no more than two species of microorganisms, okay, at least one of which is bacteria. Mixed flora likely represents more than one organism, right? So it at least represents two, okay? So she has mixed flora, even if we counted that as meeting two, but in addition to that, she grew additional organisms. I, I think this is a, a good case to also point out that presence of cloudy or odorous urine does not necessarily indicate a urinary tract infection. This is a, an assumption that we hear sometimes in the field, and so I wanted to use that in this case so that you recognize that a, a resident that has cloudy or odorous urine does not necessarily have a urinary tract infection. And, and that applies to the clinical setting as well as the NHSN surveillance setting. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the asymptomatic bacteremic urinary tract infection event, um, also referred to as a booty. And again, I'm going to use the figure that is available in the protocol. It's also available in your resource manual. And this one is really easy. The resident has no localizing signs or symptoms, so no urgency, frequency, dysuria, suprapubic tenderness, et cetera. And the resident has at least one qualifying urine culture, so the urine culture requirements are the same across all of the, U the UTI criteria. In addition to no symptoms and a positive urine, qualifying urine culture, the resident also has a positive blood culture with a matching organism to that urine. That is an abuti. And an abuti can occur in a resident with or without an indwelling catheter. So remember, when you're reporting um, abuti, you would also include all of those resident populations in that definition. I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, distinguishing uh, asymptomatic bacteria, or ASB, from asymptomatic bacteremic UTI event, a booty. We do get some of these questions, so I thought that I'd put a slide in here for, for your knowledge. And this is also good information to take back to your nursing homes for your frontline staff. The asymptomatic bacteria, or ASB, is defined as a bacteria in the urine, but without accompanying signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection. It is common in long-term care facilities, especially among your chronically catheterized residents. It is often, and, and we see this, and then the studies have also shown this, a ASB is often associated with misuse of antibiotics, which I think you all probably know this, uh, which can result in an increase in the multidrug-resistant um, infections with, in the UTI population. NHSN does not include... ASB in our surveillance criteria because we do not see it as a meaningful um, diagnosis. On the other hand, asymptomatic bacteremic UTI or a booty is included in the NHSN surveillance definitions because although the resident is asymptomatic, the resident does have that positive urine culture with a matching blood culture. So that is considered a significant event for NHSN reporting. So next, I'm going to talk about submitting a UTI event and the NHSN application. These steps are going to look very familiar to you. First, you're going to go to your left side navigation bar, and you notice you have the option to add, find, or incomplete. Add is to add a new event. Find is to find an event that you've already added. Perhaps you want to review that event, or maybe you have additional information to add to the event. If so, you would click Find and look up your event. Incomplete would be if you were interested in looking at your incomplete events within the NHSN application. So perhaps you started to complete the event form, but you ran out of time, you saved it and closed it, and you want to come back later. That would be an incomplete event. So we are going to click Add for this purposes. Again, you have your resident information. Then you go down to the resident type. You have short stay versus long stay. Remember, short stay is if the resident has been in, to, in your facility for 100 days or less from the first date of admission. Long stay is going to be a resident who has been in your facility for more than 100 days from the date of first admission. 
Next, you have the date of first admission, which is the date the resident first entered your facility. The date of current admission is the most recent date the resident entered your facility. Keep in mind, if the resident enters your facility for the first time and has not left for greater than two calendar days, the date of current admission will be the same as the date of first admission. If the resident leaves your facility for greater than two calendar days and returns, the date of current admission should be updated to reflect the date of the return to the facility. We talked about this, I actually reviewed this example in an earlier session, so it's in your slides. I'm not going to review it again. It's the exact example, so for time, we're going to keep moving forward. Okay. Event type, this is a little bit different from the lab ID, so for submitting a UTI event, for event type, you will select UTI, urinary tract infection, and then for date of event, this is defined as the date when the first clinical evidence or signs and or symptoms of the UTI appeared or the date the urine culture specimen used to meet the infection criteria was collected, whichever comes first. Next, you will select your resident care location. And this is the location of the resident on the date of event. And remember, these locations are the locations that you set up during your initial NHSN setup after enrollment. And these are the same across all reporting modules. Primary resident service type. Select the NHSN primary resident service type on the date of event. And again, these are defined, NHSN de defined locations that are located um, in the protocols under supporting materials. The next question is going to ask you, was the resident directly admitted to your facility from an acute care facility in the past four weeks? If yes is selected, additional data must be entered. So you can see from the bottom here, it's going to ask you the date of last transfer to your facility. And did the resident have an indwelling catheter at the time of transfer to your facility? Next, select the indwelling urinary catheter status of the resident at the time of event onset. You have three options to choose from. The catheter was in place on the date of event. It had been removed within the last two calendar days prior to the date of the event, or it was not in place at all. If you select in place, or removed in the last two calendar days, then additional questions will populate for you to answer. And that includes the site where the catheter was inserted. So that would be your facility, the acute care hospital, other or unknown, and then the date of indwelling catheter insertion. And that is an optional data field that is not required. If no indwelling catheter was in place on the date of event, then you will select neither, not in place. And then the, another question will pop up asking you if another urinary device was in place at the time of event onset. And by selecting yes, it will give you two options of suprapubic or intermediate straight catheter. And that is also an optional data field, so it's not required for you to enter that information. Next, as you're scrolling down the screen, the next se section is going to ask you to check all of the clinical criteria documented in the resident medical record that were used to identify the UTI that you are reporting. You're going to want to check all of the laboratory and diagnostic testing that were used to meet the criteria. And remember, what you check on this in this section must match the criteria in the UTI protocol. So if I check fever, and I check specimen collection. 
What happens next is the application will use the internal business rules and it will look at the catheter status of that resident that you selected on the prior screen in addition to the signs and symptoms in laboratory diagnostic and it will auto-populate for you the specific event. So it will define the UTI event for you so that you don't have to think about it, okay? So in this case, uh, I reported that the resident did have an indwelling urinary device and I met the specific signs and symptoms that are needed to meet Kasuti, and the, the application defined the event for me. Next, you will check yes, the resident had a microorganism reported in the urine and also had that same microorganism reported in the blood. Otherwise, check no. I know the question asked for secondary bloodstream infection, it doesn't mean that there's a whole set of criteria for secondary bloodstream infection because the long-term care facility component does not currently have bloodstream infections as part of our criteria. So all you're looking for for this data field is if there was the presence of a positive urine culture with a matching positive blood culture. If so, click yes. Transfer to an acute care facility within seven days. You will select yes if the resident transferred to an acute care facility for any reason and the seven days after the date of event. That reason does not have to be related to a UTI. It's any reason at all. And then optionally, you can check yes or no if the resident died within seven days after the date of event. And again, that is optional. Then you're going to scroll down to select the pathogens that were identified in that urine culture. You will select yes, that pathogens were identified because otherwise no is not applicable since a pathogen is required for a urinary tract infection in NHSM. So select yes. And then you have um, the option to enter up to two pathogens in a UTI without a positive blood culture. But if you did identify that the resident also had a positive blood culture, you're going to have three options for pathogens to enter here. So you will enter the pathogen, and when you click on this down arrow, it's going to give you a long list of pathogens to scroll to and find your pathogen. And then you're going to select your susceptibility data based on what's in your laboratory report. I have a little key over here for you. If you're having problems understanding the abbreviations of the drugs or some of the abbreviations, other abbreviations, if you go to the form, the urinary tract infection event form, the very, I think it's the very last page has all of these acronyms and abbreviations listed for you. And then the last part of adding a UTI event are the two additional option screen are the two additional optional um, custom custom fields and comments and remember custom fields is a great option but you must set that up before you report at least one event and once you set up your custom field options then it will populate for every event after that that you enter and then comment section will always be available for you to enter free text for internal use in your facility okay Next, we're going to talk about denominator data for the urinary tract infection module. There is one form available to allow users to capture uh, daily and aggregate denominator data for the facility. You will use one form per month. And again, it allows a daily count in your facility. And then at the end of the month, you would enter the sum, the aggregate total, into the NHSN application. And for your denominator data, you're looking at your number of residents for the month, number of residents with a urinary catheter during the month, number of new antibiotic starts for UTI indication, and number of urine cultures ordered. To enter your denominator data on the left navigation bar, you're going to click Summary Data and then Add. Again, the NHSN facility ID will auto-populate for you. Select the month and year for which you're entering your denominator data. And then denominator data for the UTI surveillance will go under the section called Denominators for Long-Term Care Facility. The location code will default to fac wide in since this is required for surveillance. And then you will enter everything demonstrated with a red asterisk.
I want to go through these denominator um, questions just to give you a little bit um, additional clarification. Resident days is the total number of residents in the facility for the month. Do not include residents for whom a bed is being held, but they're not actually in your facility. So the resident needs to be present in your facility to be included in total resident days. Next, urinary catheter days. For each month, enter the total number of residents in the facility who had an indwelling urinary device. Keep in mind that the count does not include non-indwelling urinary devices such as your in-out straight catheter. It does not include condom cast, suprapubic cath, or nephrost nephrostomy tubes. We've talked about the report no events, and this is if your monthly reporting plan indicates that you are following UTI surveillance for the month, but you were lucky and your facility, facility did not have any UTIs to report for the month, you would simply check report no UTIs in the box. And you can see in this screenshot here, there's no red asterisk and it's grayed out. So would we, would we put a check mark in this box? No, because that, what this means is that we did report at least one UTI for the month, so it's disabled. Okay, the new antibiotic starts for UTI indication. This is the monthly sum, so that the total of all new prescriptions slash orders for antibiotics given to residents in your facility suspected or diagnosed with having a urinary tract infection. The you want to count the antibiotic starts even if the infection that is being treated did not meet the criteria for a symptomatic UTI event. Still count that, okay? Capture all new antibiotic orders regardless of the number of doses or days of therapy that the resident receives the antibiotic. Do not include antibiotic courses that are started by another healthcare facility prior to the resident's admission or readmission back to your facility even if the resident continues with the antibiotic while in your facility. So this, this variable is only looking at new antibiotic starts or orders that, that take place in your facility. Number of urine cultures ordered. For each month, you want to add the total number of urine cultures ordered in your facility. You want to include new urine cultures ordered for a resident regardless if the resident had a UTI meeting the NHSN criteria. Do not include urine cultures or urine culture orders by another healthcare facility prior to the resident's admission or readmission back to your facility. So this is specific to the orders that come out of your facility. Okay. Now I want to do a review of everything we just talked about. UTI surveillance does include residents with or without an indwelling urinary device. The symptomatic UTI, both catheter and non-catheter associated protocol, criteria combine your sign and symptoms with that laboratory and culture data. That is very important. The asymptomatic bacteremic UTI is defined as residents have no signs or symptoms localizing to the urinary tract, but the resident does have a matching culture with that blood and urine, meaning the, the blood culture and a urine culture have the same organism, at least one same organism. Mixed flora is not considered an organism and cannot be submitted to NHSN as a pathogen. Yeast cannot be reported for, as an organism for a UTI. A urine culture with yeast can be included only if the urine culture also has at least one qualifying bacterium. To determine or to be considered catheter associated, the catheter must be in place for a minimum of two calendar days, and that means the day the catheter is inserted equals day one. And it has to be in place at the time of the event, so on the calendar day of the event, or removed within two calendar days prior to event onset. The date of event is the date when the first clinical evidence, such as signs and or symptoms, of the UTI appeared, 
or the date the specimen used to make that diagnosis was collected, so that positive urine culture was collected, whichever comes first. Infection should be attributed as a healthcare-associated infection to the long-term care facility if there is no evidence of an incubating infection at the time of admission to the facility, and you want to look at doc clinical documentation of appropriate signs and symptoms, not just at your uh, culture data when you're looking at um, evidence of infection on admission. And the clinical onset occurs two greater than two calendar days after admission to your facility. And remember, best practice is to report any present on admission urinary tract infections, report that back to the transferring facility so that they can investigate and include those infections in their numbers. As a reminder, at the present time, the long-term care facility UTI protocol does not have a set time period for which only one UTI may be reported for the same resident. So this is very different from our acute care partners if, if you all follow the patient safety component as well. So following a UTI, which is, which is, is either present on admission or healthcare associated, it's important to look at all of the clinical information that you have available to determine if that resident develops a new UTI. Okay, so some examples of documentation that may be important to look at in the medical record is, did the signs and symptoms resolve? Did the resident complete antimicrobial therapy? And was there a time period that the resident was asymptomatic? And then all of a sudden, things change. There's new onset of urinary tract signs and symptoms. A new urine culture is positive. And those are just some examples. Again, this is one of the scenarios that you can certainly feel free to submit those cases to NHSN and we can help you. And we do, these are the kind of cases that we do get submitted to us and we're more than happy to help you troubleshoot and determine if it should be considered a new infection or considered a continuation of the prior infection. Okay, ready to check your knowledge? Case scenario one. If DHQP Nursing Home is interested in submitting UTI data into the NHSN for only the dementia unit, which locations must be selected when setting up the NHSN monthly reporting plan? A, the dementia unit if it has been mapped in the NHSN as a resident care location. B, facility-wide inpatient must be selected on the NHSN monthly reporting plan and UTI surveillance must be performed and all resident care locations, or C, facility-wide inpatient must be selected on the NHSN monthly reporting plan, but the facility can limit UTI surveillance to include only that dementia unit. Okay, let's see how you did. Okay. So the correct answer is B. So remember, facility-wide inpatient must be selected on that NHSN reporting plan, and UTI surveillance must be performed in all resident care locations in the facility. I know C is wishful thinking. I'm going to forgive that one. Okay, so I just read this to you, okay. Case scenario two, during the, during the monitoring month at DHQP's skilled nursing facility, a newly admitted 69-year-old female has a clean catch urine culture growing greater than 100,000 colony counts of E. coli reported from the lab on 216. She was admitted from a local hospital on 2-1, with an indwelling urinary catheter, but it had been removed on 2-4. Medical record was, was reviewed and showed she had fever of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, new incontinence, sweating, and suprapubic tenderness on 2-13. A urine culture was ordered and a clean catch voided urine was collected on 2-14. This is going to be a lot to remember on the next page. 
Does the resident have a UTI? So this, the clickers will not work for this, so we're going to do a show of hands. So who says the resident has a UTI? And what event date would you say? So yes, she has a SUTI. 213, because this was the date when the first clinical evidence um, appeared, right? Is the SUTI event catheter associated? Who says yes? No? Okay, you're correct. No, because that urinary device was removed greater than two days prior to event onset. What was her resident type? Short stay or long stay? Remember, she was newly admitted, so she'd be what? Short stay. Okay. She was in the facility less than 100 days. Okay. And here's the um, example here. And I don't, I don't think you guys have this in your handouts, right? Um, but I, th I think we're going to make all these answers available to you with the justification. Case scenario two. What if the resident, continued, what if the resident had the same sign and symptoms, but the urine culture grew greater than 100,000 colonies of E. coli, less than 50 colonies of Klebsiella and mixed flora? What then? A, this resident would be considered as having a super infection. B, the NHSN UTI definition is not met and a UTI should not be reported. Or C, the NHSN UTI definition is still met and a UTI should be reported. So your clickers will work for this one. Okay. Great job. B is correct. Nothing. So this is a resident without an indwelling catheter. She had the fever, correct. She also had at least one of these, but she ended up having two. She had increase in suprapubic tenderness. She also had new or marked increase in incontinence and the urine culture requirements of no more than two species of microorganisms. Good job. Define the date of event for a UTI. A, date the urine culture was collected. B, date when the first clinical evidence of infection appeared or the date the specimen used to meet the infection criteria was collected, whichever comes first. C, the date the urine culture is ordered. Or D, whatever date I decide is correct. I know I'm going to see some Ds on this. Okay, we ready to see your responses? Huh, very good. 3% of you are really confused. <laughs> so B, the correct answer is B. The date the first clinical evidence of infection appeared or the date that specimen was collected, whichever comes first. Okay, case scenario four. A resident had a Foley catheter in place for three days and had documentation of new suprapubic pain on March 1st. The resident had a urine specimen collected and sent for culture on March 3rd that was positive for greater than 100,000 colony forming units of E. coli. What would be the date of event? A, March 1st, since this is the, is the date of symptom onset and it occurred before the date of the culture collection. Mar B, March 3rd, since this is the date the urine culture was collected, or C, the date the urine culture res results were reported. Okay. What just happened? Oh. oh, there we go. Okay. Good job. 
A, March 1st, since this is the date of symptom onset and it occurred before the date of culture collection. Great job. Let's go on to case scenario five. Mr. T is a 94-year-old resident in the facility. He had a, he has a history of multiple medical issues. On 3-3, blood, urine, and foot cultures were collected. You received the following lab reports reported on 3-5. Blood culture was positive for greater than 100,000 of streptococcus pyogenes. A urine culture was positive for greater than 100,000 of streptococcus pyogenes. And then a foot culture was positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Mr. J does have an indwelling catheter that has been in place for the past 10 days, but you do not find documentation indicating signs or symptoms of a urinary tract infection. So all you have is the positive lab results. Does Mr. T have a UTI? A, no, because he does not have signs or symptoms of a UTI. B, yes, he has an abuti. Or C, I'm not sure. Okay, let's see how you did. Very good. Yes, he has an abuti. So the next question is, is this UTI catheter associated? So is this a catheter associated abuti? A, yes, and dwelling catheter was in place at the time of specimen collection and was in place greater than two calendar days. B, no, and indwelling catheter does not qualify. Okay, let's see how you did. Great job. Yes, an indwelling urinary catheter was in place and had been in place, I think he said, for 10 days. Good job. So here is the example answers here. So he had that positive matching blood culture with no localizing signs or symptoms, and he also met our urine culture requirements going to change course a little bit and see how you guys do a denominator collection. Based on this information, we had our indwelling urinary catheter count at 12 noon on May 2nd. So we, we did our catheter count at 12 noon. How many catheter days do we have if you look at this table? Is the polling working? For this, are you guys able to? It doesn't look like it is. Okay, how many of you say A? Six, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, we have a trick question here. The correct answer is three. Here's why. So room 101 had an indwelling catheter. Room 104 has an indwelling catheter. Room 106 has an indwelling catheter. And um, room 108, the Foley was inserted at 2 p.m. So that Foley was not in place at the time of our count. So this is an example of why it's important for the facilities to have some kind of consistency in place when you collect your denominator data. So you want to look at... A certain time, and it's, it's, you can pick any time of the day you want, but you want to be consistent in how you do it every day so that you're getting accurate denominators. And if I had cookies to give out, I would give all of you a cookie because you have been a trooper for me today. So we have a little bit of time. We have six minutes exactly. So you can take a stretch break or we can answer questions. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Do we have any web streamers with a question? Okay, sorry. 
We had a couple of questions from the web stream audience on how a skilled nursing facility in a swing bed situation would fit into the um, device associated UTI reporting. So is this a swing bed in the skilled nursing facility? So that is a great question. And I'm not sure that I can answer that question. <laughs> um, I guess it would depend if the swing bed was, lo which unit the swing bed was located in. So if the swing bed is located in one south, then the data collected in that bed goes into one south data, regardless of if different nursing staff take care of that bed. Does that make sense? So it de it's dependent on the location of the bed. And we have one more question from a web streamer. To the, to the person who submitted that location question, if you could please submit that to the NHSN mailbox, I want to make sure that I give you a thorough answer, and I'm happy to do that, but I just want to get some clarification first. Okay. And one more. Um, this question is, if a resident goes out to the ED and they are tested for UTI, the resident is sent back to the facility with no admission. Do we count these tests in our count? No. Well, 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 so the, okay, so the resident went to the, okay, I take that back. So the resident went to emergency department and came back the same day. It just says they're sent back to the facility with no admission. That's a good question. If your resident, so the setting rules would still apply. If the resident goes to an emergency department, has a, a urine culture, you can use that urine culture as long as the resident returns back to your facility the day of transfer or the next day. And if the resident met the criteria, the long-term care facility criteria for a UTI, then you would count that as a UTI for your facility. Now, if the resident was admitted to that acute care facility, the, the UTI does not count against your facility, only if it's an outpatient situation. Good question. Okay, so Elizabeth Mungai is up next, and she is going to bless you all with wonderful analysis um, tools and tips and tricks. But before Elizabeth talks, we have one more question. Is this on? Oh, hi. hi. I'm Pam. I'm from Great Falls, Montana. I'm kind of curious about the two fields um, on the, on the um, denominator, or I think it's on the denominator, but for um, asking the number of... Um, antibiotics that were ordered and then the number of cultures that were drawn. I'm just kind of curious as to what you plan on using that data for. Is it going to be included as a risk, you know, risk stratification or kind of what are you looking for? That's a great question and that really ties into what Elizabeth is going to talk about. So there is um, a metric in the analysis for each of those questions and Elizabeth is going to share some examples with you all how that data will be used but that is a great question and we do plan to use that data to look at practices in the facility. We have, I could take one more question. Um, I just wanted to ask, to clarify, so for the antibiotic use, you said that you put that in even if it doesn't meet the NHSN UTI definition? Correct. So theoretically you could have a facility with zero NHSN UTIs, but multiple or a single or multiple antibiotic use in that category. Correct, and, and that is one of the metrics that are being looked at is how many cultures are ordered versus how many UTIs are actually identified, how many antibiotics are ordered um, in comparison to the rates of UTIs that you're seeing in your facility. Yes. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you all.